In this video we will be discussing the topic of electromagnetism. It's found in chapter 10 of the ACDC Principles and Applications textbook published by Advanced Technical Publications written by Paul Schultz. We're going to be spending paying special attention to magnetism and electromagnetic induction. Our objectives, we want to explain how conductors and coils form electromagnet, explain the concept of electromagnetic induction, describe operating principles of DC generators, and then we're going to get into some math using the formulas and, and math handouts I will provide you. We're going to start by asking what is electromagnetism? Electromagnetism is the relationship of magnetism and electricity. The word electromagnetism is made of two words, electro for electricity and magnetism for magnets. These two forces of magnetism and electricity are inseparable. First of all, any time current travels through an electrical wire, there is a magnetic field associated with that wire. There is a magnetic field that rotates around that wire. If we look straight on to a wire, like it is going into the board, like an arrow being shot into the board, if current would be traveling along that arrow, the magnetic field would rotate around that wire like this. We can also take that wire, wrap it into a coil shape, and greatly increase the amount of magnetic force. And this coil of wire will then take on the properties of a bar magnet with a north and south pole. So here again we see that with no electrical current every electron is moving in its own direction and all of their magnetic fields do not add up. But once we apply electrical current through this wire, in this case here a DC power source, this is representing a wire, it's just enlarged, all of the electrons will align up and all of their magnetic fields will aid one another and it will produce a magnetic field around that wire. Some of the places where we see this principle put to use that we're going to be dealing with, doing some labs on, and that you would be troubleshooting as a technician are solenoid valves, electromagnets, electrical motors, and electrical generators. Another thing to keep in mind here is that if you had electrical current traveling through two wires, if that electrical current is flowing in opposite directions, these two electrical wires would move away from one another. Whereas if you had electrical current traveling in the same direction in both wires, this way, this way, these two wires would be attracted to one another. So in this case, opposites repel and likes attract. It's a little bit different. And I guess this could be important if you had some very high voltage cables. You would have to keep those cables a certain amount apart. If you did not keep them a certain distance apart, they would attract to one another and possibly cause a shark. On this slide we see the left hand rule for conductors. Basically what this shows us is that we can determine the direction of the rotation of the magnetic field which will be important when we get further into motors using the left hand rule. When your thumb is pointing in the direction of current flow your fingers will wrap around the wire in the direction of the magnetic field's rotation. Now in order for us to understand electromagnetism we must first take a closer look at magnetism itself. We have all felt the force of magnetic attraction of one magnetic pole attracting the opposite magnetic pole. For instance with two bar magnets as you see here. These lines of magnetic attraction can be measured, they can be quantified, and the name for these lines of magnetic attraction is called magnetic flux symbolized by the Greek letter phi and there are two units of measure for these lines of magnetic flux one unit is the Maxwell which equals one line of magnetic flux this is in the CGS system a much larger measurement of magnetic attraction is the Weber and a Weber is 1 times 10 to the 8th lines of magnetic attraction. This is a 1 with 8 zeros behind it or 100 million lines of magnetic flux. So the Weber is much larger than the Maxwell. Not only do we want to look at magnetic lines of flux, but we also want to look at flux density. Symbolized by the letter B, flux density is the number of lines per unit area of magnetic flux. 
our equation is magnetic flux B is equal to phi divided by A, our area. Now there's also two units of measure for flux density. The first one is the Gauss, which is one Maxwell per square centimeter. The next one is the Tesla, which is one Weber per square meter. So the Tesla is much larger than the Gauss, and we're going to be looking closer at those when we get into the math section dealing with the handout and the formulas that I will provide you. So let's look at flux density in this manner. Over here we have the CGS system which is the centimeter gram second system and here's our formula B is equal to phi over A where phi is measured in Maxwell's and A is measured in centimeters. This gives us an answer in Gauss. In the SI system when we're looking for flux density it's equal to phi measured in Weber's over area measured in square meters. This is given to us in Tesla's. Now sometimes we will have to convert from Gauss to Tesla and from Tesla to Gauss. So if I'm looking for Gauss and I have Tesla, I will use this formula. If I'm looking for Tesla and I have Gauss, I will use this formula to convert from one to the other. In some of our calculations, it may be necessary to rearrange this formula. We can use the circle with three letters in it as we did with Ohm's law. Remember that any three letter algebraic equation can be put in a circle and as long as you have two out of the three you can find the third. So the original presentation of this formula to us was B is equal to phi over A and I put it in the circle here for us. But what if we're looking for phi? Well phi would be equal to B times A and if I'm looking for area it is equal to phi over A. Remember just cover up whatever you're looking for and then you can find the third. So if I cover up phi it's equal to B times A. If I'm looking for B it's phi over A. And if I'm looking for area it is phi divided by B. Now we have said previously that any time electrical current travels through a wire there is a corresponding magnetic field around that wire. We can greatly increase the strength of that magnetic field by wrapping that wire into a loop. If we continue to wrap that wire into the shape of a coil the magnetic field will take on the properties of a bar magnet as you see here with a north and south pole polarity. A coil of wire with more than one loop is generally called a solenoid. An ideal solenoid has a length much greater than its diameter. By adding an iron core to the inside of a coil we can greatly increase the strength of the flux density and this is an application we're going to look at more closely when we study transformers. So here you can see also they have the wire wrapped in a loop and all of the magnetic fields are now combining to rotate in a certain manner to create the same type of magnet that you have when you had a bar magnet with a north and south pole. The magnetic strength and force of these magnetic fields is known as magnetomotive force. The equation is MMF, the abbreviation for magnetomotive force, is equal to I for the current in the wire times N, which is the number of windings or loops in the coil and the unit of measure is the ampere turn. So MMF is equal to I times N and the answer will be given in ampere turns. And we're going to do some calculations with that and I'll show you that more closely. But just know for now that we can and will be able to measure the strength of these magnetic fields created by these coils. The next topic we need to discuss is electromagnetic induction. So far we've been looking at the fact that we can create a magnet with electricity. But now we're going to look at the fact that you can use a magnetic field to create electrical current. So we can create magnets with electricity and we can create electricity with magnets. If you take a conductive wire right here and you move it through this magnetic field, you will measure on this amp meter electrical current. As you continue to move, now the wire has to be moved it has to be cutting across the lines of magnetic flux. We can't just stick a wire in here and not move it and leave it stationary and it continue to create current. No, it won't do that. You have to continue to move it and cut across the lines of magnetic attra attraction. You have to be cutting through the flux in order for it to produce an electrical current. This is known as electromagnetic induction. We can also create or induce electrical current from one wire to another with electromagnetic induction and this is how a transformer works. On this slide here we see basic transformer. You have your primary winding which is a coil wrapped around this iron core and here you have your secondary wrapped around the same iron core. The magnetic lines of flux will travel through this wire 
and this will be provided with an AC voltage. This AC voltage will be expanding and collapsing and it will be cutting across from the primary to the secondary windings inducing in the secondary an electrical current due to the principle of electromagnetic induction. All electrical current can be put into two main categories direct current and alternating current. If we were to look at direct current on an oscilloscope it would just be a straight line. Whereas if we looked at alternating current on an oscilloscope it would have a oscillating waveform through 360 degrees of oscillation known as a sinusoidal waveform and we're going to look much more into that in our future chapter on AC. But for now just know that anytime we induce in a wire electromagnetic induced current it will produce an alternating current whereas if we look back here to where we first began on the first lecture involving electricity if we use a chemical to produce electricity it produces a DC current which will flow in only one direction but electromagnetic induced electricity will produce alternating current here we see that if we move parallel to the lines of magnetic flux between the two magnets we would not induce any current. The degree to which we cut magnetic lines of flux is the degree to which we will induce current in our wire. Here we are producing zero volts at zero degrees. As we increase our degree of cut we induce a greater amount of voltage until finally at 90 degrees we for instance in this example would be producing one volt. If we got bigger magnets, we would produce more voltage. But it matters how you go through this magnetic flux. It's all about cutting through the lines of magnetic attraction. On this slide here, we see that if we take a magnetic a bar magnet and we move it between a coil of wire and this example with just a few loops of wire, we're producing one volt. If we were to increase our number of windings, and it looks like they also have a bigger magnet, we would induce a larger amount of voltage. This induced voltage is known as Faraday's law of induced voltage. This is a very important formula. We will be using it. It will be on your formula sheet. You can use your formula sheet on the test, but I want you to be familiar with this formula, which basically states that voltage induced, the induced voltage, measured in volts is equal to the number of windings of our coil times d phi over dt. Now phi you will remember is our magnetic flux. d means change over our change in time. So the faster we go through our magnetic field the more voltage we would produce. The stronger our magnetic field more voltage and the number of windings of our coil the more voltage we would induce. And this formula can also be put in a circle and we can use it in varying ways because sometimes we're going to be looking for the induced voltage. That's the simplest form. But other times we may be looking for the number of windings of our coil. So we're going to see how to rearrange this formula in various ways using the wheel. And I will show you more about that when we get to the math section. So on this slide here, we're going to be looking at our simulator to show us a little bit more about the induced electromagnetism. First of all, we see here that we have a coil and we're going to reduce our number of loops down to one. If we move our magnetic field through our coil, it does make the light bulb light up. But remember, I said you have to be moving the magnetic field. There has to be movement, relative motion. So it doesn't matter if you move the coil or if you move the magnet as long as there's relative motion between the two. You'll notice here if I just set the magnet here and I don't move it the light bulb doesn't light up. Yes it's within the magnetic field the coil is within the magnetic field but it's not cutting the lines of magnetic flux. Induced voltage is equal to number of windings times d phi over t dt. So let's increase the n in that formula the number of windings. Let's go up to three. Now with the same magnet we can see that we are greatly producing more voltage because we have increased the number of windings. We can also increase the strength of our magnet. That would be the phi, the d phi over dt. And if we move faster, we have a greater amount of change in time, and that also will produce more voltage. Now on this slide, we're going to look a little bit closer about how a transformer can work. 
if I have DC current and I move my primary winding close to my secondary winding there is no voltage produced in the secondary winding because this magnetic field is not changing but if I go to AC I now see that my magnetic field is going to be increasing and decreasing and based on this I can induce in the secondary windings of my transformer an electromagnetic current simply because there is an expanding and collapsing magnetic field in the primary windings of the wire. As long as the magnetic field is moving, and how is it moving now? Well, it's expanding and collapsing. The field itself is moving now. Remember, a transformer only works with AC. It will not work with DC. So when I go to DC, it no longer induces any voltage in the secondary. But in AC, it will induce the voltage. And as I said, we're going to look closer at transformers. Now here we can look at a very good and simple model of electrical generation. If we can spin a magnet close to a ball of wire, we can create electricity. We turn our water on and we begin to spin our magnetic field. Obviously the magnetic field is moving because the bar magnet is moving. As we increase, here we are increasing our d phi over dt, it produces more voltage in our coil that is connected to our light bulb. I can also increase the n number in that formula. Look, let's go here to loops. Now I got three loops with the same amount of magnetism, I'm producing more energy. If I go down, less energy because I have less loops. More energy because I have more loops. If I spin my magnet faster, I get more electricity. If I get a bigger magnet, right here I can turn this magnet up, I get a bigger magnet. Again, I'm inducing voltage and it is having an effect upon this compass. If you get a compass near a magnetic field or electrical wire which has a magnetic field, it will affect that compass. So in review, this chapter has been about electromagnetic induction. Magnetism electromagnetism. We understand more about it now and the magnetic fields that are associated with electrical current traveling through a wire. Next we'll be looking at the math calculations and doing some of the review questions at the end of the chapter.